Thank you for coming on today, Angus. No problem. Yeah, and maybe just to start off, would you like Thanks to talk to your, your background as industrial designer? Um, maybe talk to the highlighting experiences that have brought you to where you are today. Okay. So I've uh, been an industrial designer for a while. <laughs> uh, I graduated from QT, uh, graduate diploma in industrial design in 1993. Mm. So um, I've always worked in Brisbane. Uh, always managed to find a design job that's kind of interesting and fun and challenging. Mm. Um, started out working for a, a, a point of purchase display company uh, in Brisbane, and and that was really good. It was a it was a good way to dip my toes in um, in manufacturing. You know, it was a mm. design office attached to a factory, so um, I kind of had a little bit bit of a baptism of fire there. You know, leaving uni and um thinking that you know it all and you know you're all fired up and you want to start start getting into it and then you realize that you really know nothing yeah and, uh you know the guys out in the factory floor have no problem in telling you that you know nothing and, yeah. and um whipping you back into shape you know so that was actually a really good experience for me because i got to um i guess take stock and then just go all right I'll listen to you guys. And, mm. um, and that was a really good lesson for me. Mm. So I worked there for a number of years, um, just uh, kind of long hours and that sort of thing, um, which again, kind of gave me a pretty good work ethic, I suppose, mm. you know, starting off in working, um, you know, eight or six every day was kind of a bit of a shock to the system yeah. after drinking beers on the lawn at, at QUT for a few years, you know. I feel like um, we've had the same, the same upbringing. And uh, so I worked there for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I used to drive past uh, QUT on the way to um, Salisbury every day and I'd, I'd just look longingly at it going, oh, I'd, I'd like to be just there having beers on the lawn. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, it was good. I, and um I liked, um, I liked getting, you know, really stuck into kind of manufacturing and finding out, finding out about manufacturing processes. Mm. Um, so, you know, I got exposure to vacuum forming machines and acrylic fabrication, laser cutting. Mm. Um, I remember we got a five axis router at one point, which was like, you know, amazing new technology yeah. back then. And um, that was great. And, uh, but, you know, of course, when I started there, there were no computers, right? Mm. We, were, we all had drawing boards um and, and so you know one day we got uh, a uh computer and it ended up being in my office and ran autocad and i became the cad expert uh <laughs> and and kind of you know went from there but uh that was great then i moved on to um yeah a signage company which then mm -hmm. turned into a uh, a gaming room company so i was designing gaming rooms and wow. Um, yeah, it was a little bit evil, you know, designing chairs that would, uh, keep people seated for longer and yeah. you know, make you forget what time of day it was. So kind I of want uncomfortable seats in a gaming room. Yeah, that's right. You know, you want someone to sit there and, and spend all their money. So mm. it was, um, yeah, not, not super fulfilling. And, um, of course, so, um, went then and worked for a medical device company for a while, mm. um, which was really interesting. I learned a lot there about um, metrology and uh, a, a lot about manufacturing in China and some of the mm. challenges um, that that you face there, as well as uh, designing under the under I guess uh, you know almost crippling requirements and certification requirements and and regulations yeah. and those sorts of things that 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 happen in the medical industry. Um, and then, um, yeah, then worked for another company at um, uh, Eight Mile Plains, um, working in air conditioning controllers, but weirdly also on equipment for firefighting. So that was kind of a bit of a dual role. And they, sure. they had some in-house manufacturing capabilities there, which was really good. Um, and, and I just kind of... Uh, then kind of got back into well really dipped my toes into the consulting world mm. um and uh worked for consultancy for about six years and then came to topcom yeah. so uh 
kind of, you know, done a bit of uh, consulting, done a bit of in-house. Um, and so, you know, both were great. Um, and, you know, in-house versus consulting is always one of those big debates that people have. Mm. Uh, but, you know, both are good for their own reasons and both have their drawbacks. Um, yes, yeah, so that kind of landed at TopCon um, about six years ago. And uh, at that stage, TopCon really didn't have any internal designers. Mm. Um, they relied a lot on on uh, consultants. And because we're a, a company with locations all around the world, mm. there was kind of a, this siloed approach to design. So, you know, depending on where a particular product manager was, they would engage a, a design consultancy in that region, or maybe they wouldn't engage a design consultancy at all. Mm. Uh, so coming to TopCon and, and really uh, look, getting used to working here and finding out the lay of the land, it quickly be became apparent that we really, we needed to consolidate and we needed to bring the whole company together in terms of design. Uh, mm -hmm. Because of course, TopCon grew pretty rapidly um, uh, through acquisition of a number of other businesses. So, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of had all these, these products that look like they came from a lot of different businesses because they actually did. Yeah. And, and then bringing that all together and, and um, unifying that under one design language is, is where we're at now. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's a bit of a challenge, but it's, um, uh, you know, a great, uh, a great challenge. Yeah. What to do. <laughs> I mean, I suppose from a leadership perspective as well, having that design background, you can kind of redesign the system in more of a in more of a pragmatic way. Yeah, it's um, it's a from a design point. There's a there's the design challenge, right? Which is, mm. I guess, you know, all about you're talking about a visual uh, design language. Um, that you know, there's all the visual elements of the design. You've got mm. um. You want to link that to the brand. Uh, you want to communicate the personality and the brand uh, uh, attributes and through the product attributes. And there's mm. all of that. Uh, and that's one side of it. But the other side is, is I guess, more the, not, not political, but um, the, the organisational side of mm. things where um, you've got a bunch of engineers who maybe haven't been used to working with designers before. And so mm. now trying to insert the design process into a, a long-standing process that didn't include design. So that's got its own challenges as well. Yeah. Um, so a lot of my job is talking about design. I, I do less doing of design these days, um, but it, it's, it's really being a design evangelist, I suppose, within the company. Mm. An advocate, an advocate for the connection of design within the organization as well. That's yeah. right. And, and really trying to, um, you know, show people what the design process is and mm. how it can benefit the company through uh, innovation and and creating um, products that our our customers love to use. Okay, mm. so um, you know, it's it's something that you can talk to you blue in the face, but until people see it, they don't mm. really get it. You know, you see the so results. That's part of the challenge too. Is is really. Um, knowing when to stop talking and when to um, just put forward some good work, you know, mm. is, is the, um, when, how do you measure the metrics of successful work in, in terms of like having the foundation of design? Like, I, I feel like sometimes with design, like, you know, giving like kind of arguing that, that, that point, whether it's going to be important or not can sometimes be difficult due to it being hard to like, you know, quantify the improvements of design. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the eternal struggle of designers. Yeah. I think is is trying to uh, justify your position, justify your profession, even most of the time. <laughs> to be honest with you, um, and and what is the value of that? You know, often mm. it's really intangible, and and you can um, you can say that hey, we've increased the usability of this um, this product, but what by how what percentage? You know, what's yeah. The metric to you talking to an accountant well how much buy you know uh so it's it's very um it's very hard to do that i recently went to uh the red dot design museum mm. in essen and i was over there for a, a trade show 
and I picked up a book over there that was called The Value of Design. And, and it was the Red Dot um, organization had kind of come up with this way of measuring the value of design and it had put it into a book and done a, done a bunch of case studies. And that really got me fired up because I was, you know, I was like, oh, finally, I've got the tool to be able to, to go forward. And I brought the book back and then made everybody in the office read it. <laughs> but uh, really, it, it broke design down into its different elements and then looked at, you know, in in these cases, looked at big companies, right? Because mm. a lot of a lot of big companies are, are the ones who are entering the Red Dot Design Award. Mm. Um, and and it kind of looked at um, financial information that was available and tracked their design progress. And it was kind of about consistency of mm. of design. So you know how for how long has this company been implementing some kind of design strategy mm. and then uh it gave that kind of like a, a score right mm. and then uh and then what was the strength of that design strategy you know some mm. companies had a, a lot were a lot stronger in design than others mm. but you know um it, it kind of the, the effect of design was was more actually if you did, they did it over a long period of time they weren't necessarily amazing at it let's say but they did it for a long period of time and that, and that really um gave them that longevity uh that that was worth a lot you know yeah and then, uh, on the other hand there were companies that had only been doing it a short amount of time but maybe they were really really good book um for any designer to get i think you can probably get it on amazon or or somewhere but yeah, yeah the value of design it got me yeah really revved up about um okay we really need to get stuck in and start um making a difference here yeah no oh, yeah definitely um yeah. how have you designed how have you observed the evolution of design industry over your years and what significant changes or trends have you witnessed i'm sure you've well, witnessed many changes yeah there's been a lot i mean um <laughs> i remember i mean like CAD, for instance, when I was mm. at uni, right? You know, it was, uh, we were doing stuff in Corel Draw and oh. AutoCAD. Like we were doing 3D modeling in AutoCAD. <laughs> and um, I don't even know if SolidWorks existed back then. Mm. Uh, not sure. But um, yeah, like obviously, you know, how how CAD has developed and, mm. and just the tools now are so amazing compared to what, what we were doing when I finished, I mean, to get what's when I finished uni, um, to give you an example, I was just thinking the other day of prototyping, right? So mm. one of the very first injection molding projects I worked on was this big overhead dispenser. And this is, this was at the first company I worked at and, uh, it was a cigarette dispenser. I had these mm. trays of cigarettes that you pull down and they typically sat over the top of a counter at a, uh, at a servo or something like that. Mm. And so I was prototyping this uh, out of acrylic um, and made the whole, the, all of the trays that were to be injection molded, I broke them down into individual parts that were laser cut oh. uh, from sheet acrylic. And then uh, the ribs were these big sort of panels that were probably sort of 500 by 500 mm. and they had all these ribs on them. And so all those ribs were cut out of um, three mil acrylic and then, over the weekend, I'd like sit in front of the TV and glue them all together, and uh, basically doing a manual three D print of layers. Yeah. Um, and that's how we prototyped yeah. back then, you know. And um, now, obviously, the advent of three D printing and and where that's come, that's helped, um, you know, a massive amount. Even yeah. even when I was you know, consulting, uh, and that was only really maybe ten years ago um you know 3d printing was still something that we weren't quite couldn't quite afford you know to have into the office uh, well now yeah. you can have them at home you know you yeah, can have a really right. pretty printer for like a thousand dollars i know yeah, yeah. you crazy. can have an average one for like a couple of hundred it's crazy yeah yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's kind of within the reach of everyone yeah, yeah you can buy them from office works or whatever <laughs> you know so um you know that's changed a lot yeah. um and models that we used to make out of foam, now we just print them mm. because, you know, that, and it's kind of, um, 
it's kind of a double-edged sword because yes. making a model out of foam is a really hands-on experience mm. and you and you get to really shape that that design yeah. um it does require you to have a bit of skill in mm. in doing that to, for it to be um as per the design but um but that's got its own advantages you know mm. now we will 3d print something because we can and it allows us to work on something else while that's running you know yeah. um so there's some efficiencies there but you know uh i have thought that it, it might be good to get some blue foam mm. back into the studio and start playing around with that just for yeah. you know just for especially fun. for service modeling and stuff like i feel like you small service changes you can really work it out a lot easier in foam whereas yeah. like when you're in cad sometimes i feel like it's harder to work these kind of things out well yeah and this is one of the things that i try to um push um with my teams is sketching yeah, and sketching, ideation yeah. on paper don't mm. just jump into cad yeah. because your ability in cad kind of limits um your imagination to some mm. degree you know if you're a really if you're a gun at cad and you can really mm. um ideate quickly um in that space sure um mm. but i think sketching seems to be one of those things that is becoming a bit of a lost art in design yeah um, but at the same and, time i feel like it's timeless like there's always going to be people who sketch industrial design. like i doubt there's ever going to be a replacement well yeah you would hope so you would yeah. hope so i mean um less and less i see i see less and less graduates that can sketch mm. um, and um that's a shame i think yeah. it, you know anyone that that's one of the things that when i'm looking to hire someone the sketching ability is pretty high on the list yeah um, but of course it's not just being able to sketch i mean you mm. can sketch glass or you can sketch a couple or mm. you know a chair or whatever but you need to be able to ideate and sketch mm. which is different skill you know that idea that's right yeah Yeah. and i think um you know it's especially in the consulting world if you can sketch in a meeting Mm. um and create something you know that that's that connects with that with with your client and it's Mm. like you you know sketch it out this is what you're talking about yeah Um, that's a pretty powerful tool to be able to um secure that job Mm. you know um so yeah, it, it, it's a skill that I think is really important uh, and something that um, that maybe some of the the um, universities aren't quite focusing yeah. enough on. Well, from my experience, I can say, like, I I was never that good at sketching. I still, I wouldn't say I'm still that good at sketching, but I um, went through uni and, like, kind of got to the point where they were, like, pushing the sketching to some degree, but then it kind of just mm. dropped off and I could still get good marks without being great at sketching um so then I didn't improve but then it got to the end of uni and I was like I want to improve my sketching like it's one of those things where I feel like I'm lacking in that area so I Mm. actually spend my own time kind of getting good at it and I'm getting better at at least and um you know but like I I only knew that from talking to other people like realistically I feel like it should have been more emphasized in university that it's important a really important skill and we and every designer should be able to do it because I feel like it was kind of like if you can do it it's great but you don't have to do it yeah 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 Yeah. i think you know and look to a certain degree it's true right there are a lot of other tools out there um but but it's it's such a um you know we've all got hands right it's a really great and easy way of you don't always have you think visually as well but designers specifically think visually yeah yeah and and so being able to do that and quickly get that idea out Mm. um is is fantastic Mm. i mean the 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 job that I had where I was you know at the air, at the air conditioning control place I mean the the managing director there kind of said to me oh yeah I, I was looking for someone who had some sort of engineering uh, ability but I also needed someone who um, who could draw and I didn't really think that that person existed and then we did some research and found out that was an industrial designer <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like yeah and he and he's one of his things that he always said to me was like I love how I can just talk about stuff and then you can draw it yeah and then I can see it and say yep yeah, that's it you know yeah. and that that's that's that, that's all you need like realistically you don't really need to be the best person at rendering through sketching like no. it, it, is, it is good but I think like what you're saying just having that that ability to communicate what someone's saying that's that's really all it is yeah 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 it's it, it's mm. visual communication right so 
um, you know, your perspective doesn't have to be exactly perfect, but yeah. if it's close enough and, yeah. and and it communicates what you're trying to get across, well mm. then, you know, that's yeah. Fine. Yeah, in um, my current work for in my current workplace, I've realized like there isn't really sketching practice at all. And um, I think I want to try and bring that in. Like I'm gonna when I when I get into more technical stuff, I'm gonna start sketching and putting things up around my desk to try and you know promote yeah. it a bit. Um, yeah. Because I think like even just for me, like, I I even really like the like physical sketching over digital sketching. Like I like digital yeah. sketching to some degree, but I think that a lot of people just use it as their only form of sketching now. And I feel like you mm. lose something, especially with concept sketching, when you when you yeah. don't have that physical feedback of the paper. Absolutely, and look, I've fallen into the same trap. Uh, mm. Trap uh in you know in the consulting world where you become really comfortable with with CAD and with rendering packages and yep. uh you're doing a presentation you know you might be doing like a first round concept presentation and you mm. want it to look amazing and you really want to you know <laughs> impress the client um and then and you make it look amazing and perfect but actually it shouldn't be you know yeah. what it, what it should look is unfinished and it should look like there's a lot of work still to do here yeah. because, and it should also look like it can be changed because mm. what I've found is, you know, you might get a, a negative reaction towards a particular concept from a, a client mm. because even though you've told them, oh, this can all change, what they see is is something that appears to be finished. Exactly. Mm. And, and they're going, oh, I don't like that, you know, mm. and then because they're not used to, breaking down the reasons why they don't like it that communication then becomes more difficult mm. and, it, and it's harder to get to the core of okay what do you like what don't you like yeah. um and I, people just seem to respond better to 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 sketching mm. you know i think it's just more comfortable and um and they're impressed by it that's the other thing people are kind of impressed by it and they yeah. And they kind of go, oh, there's that element of, wow, I can't do that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so um, yeah, I find that they're a bit more, uh, you, those barriers, those client designer barriers sometimes are there, they, they break down a bit more. Hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely a good way to think about it. Um, moving moving on, your, you've had a career in manufacturing and um, that was one of the reasons why I specifically wanted to get you on here was because I think a lot of designers um, in the consulting world, they don't really get that foundation in manufacturing. And it's sometimes harder to, you know, design for manufacturing when you don't have that foundation. Um, yeah. So so going talking about Australia in terms of manufacturing, we already kind of mentioned this. Um, do you think that Australia will continue to make efforts to bring more manufacturing back on shore? Because, you know, over your career, you've probably observed so much of the manufacturing moving off sea, offshore, which obviously yeah. has positives and negatives. Um yeah, what are your thoughts on the move, and do you think maybe it will come back in the future? Yeah, look, it's a it's a really difficult one to say. I mean, mm. um, I think manufacturing in Australia has been neglected for a long time. Yeah. And so, what that means is that there's been, um, I guess, a decline uh, for a while, and and that means that the that the the increase or the, you know, having it come back is going to also take some time. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, the fundamental thing is everybody's really used to buying cheap TVs, right? Yeah. And, you know, um, that uh, manufacturing overseas in, in China, let's say, to, to pick an example, you know, labour costs are lower. Yeah. Uh, labour costs in here, uh, in Australia, you know, a lot higher. There are a lot more um, barriers for manufacturers here. Um, so, you know, the onus is on our governments to get the the um, the environment right so mm. that manufacturing can grow. Yeah. But I also think that, you know, COVID has, ha and, and some of the supply chain issues that we've seen that coming out of that, uh, as well as what's, global supply chain anymore you know we can't just sort of um hang a hat on it so i think there is a lot of people now thinking about hey you know they're probably taking manufacturing in australia a bit more seriously mm. um we do some manufacturing in australia uh, for our ag products yep. um but the majority of it is um uh, in the u.s um yep. with with some uh components um 
coming from Southeast Asia. Um, but we also manufacture um, in Europe as well. So we're kind of, you know, all over the place. Um, you know, my experience has been that in Australia, because ma manufacturing hasn't really been prioritised by, by governments, um, there isn't that depth here. Mm. Like if you want to find a really good die caster in Australia, you know, good luck. You don't have yeah. that many options, right? Yeah. There's plenty of injection molds um, and and that's good. But of course, tooling is expensive here. Yeah. Um, so shipping the tooling over is also really expensive. That's right. Yeah. yeah, but you know, you can you can buy a tool from China, mm. um, ship it over. If it's a bit rubbish, you can fix it up and it's still cheaper than the tool you made in Australia, right? Yeah. So, and lots of, you know, lots of businesses are doing that. Mm. So I think um, maybe that model, I can't see that model really changing too much um, because at the end of the day, whether, whether it be a client that walks in the door um, of, a, uh, of a consultancy or, you know, an in-house um, uh, application, you know, no one wants to pay more than what they have to. Yeah. You know? Um, so well, it always comes down to money in the end. Like you can be, you can be the most crazy designer, but it's, you're always going to be limited by the cost of your production. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and cost is a massive, um, a massive thing depending on the markets, you know, um, like we, we work across at Topco on agriculture, you know, construction and, and geo positioning and the agriculture market is very tight in terms of um, uh, cost of goods and, and margins and those sorts of things because he's selling to farmers, right? And yeah. the farmers are, they're not that flush with cash, right? They're getting they, ripped off by the supermarkets. Yeah. So, um, yeah, when, you, when they're getting paid, like, you know, hardly anything for their, for their milk, um, they don't have a lot of money to throw around. So um, some markets are, 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 have a bit more room to than others, but cost is always going to be um, a big factor. Yeah. And, and so, but the flip side of that is, you know, landed cost. Mm. So the big difference and some, the big difference is it might cost you, maybe it costs you three times more or twice as much to make something in Australia as it does in China. Um, but the landed cost of those goods are, mm. are something that businesses really have to take into account because, in my experience, a lot of management goes into getting um, good quality goods out of China, landed mm. without any issues. Yeah. So all of that, you know, you got people sitting on meetings talking with suppliers. You've got trips to China. You've got um, all people of the cost of China, that, yeah. You know, and and I was actually having a discussion with one of our um, European manufacturers, and they were they were getting some of their components from China, but they're actually um, thinking that it was it was getting to the point where maybe they'll just start um sourcing from germany again yeah <laughs> you know so um that's something that's not always apparent and and i guess there needs to be um a bit of analysis going into mm. you know exactly what is the landed cost of that component compared to coming from from locally because uh, freight as well you know yeah freight is crazy from china i don't understand like how, how it's so expensive sometimes um, I feel like as well, you know, long term, China has expanded so quickly, and mm. you know, like twenty years ago, it was just farm. Well, not farmers, but you know, I mean, like Shenzhen, for example, was not even a city twenty years ago, really, and then now it's this crazy like hub of technology. Um, like sometimes when countries grow this quick, they have a lot of issues, and you know, we don't really know what's going to happen long term. Yeah, true, and also the other part of it is, um, you know, workers over there are becoming more um, westernized, I suppose, for want of a yeah. better word, that, that that they're kind of seeing that, hang on a minute, we we aren't getting paid very much. Yeah. They're making <laughs> so, so much money. So, so the labor cost, the labor cost in China is is not going down, it's going up. Mm. And um, so that has an impact as well. And that kind of maybe lessens in some cases the yeah. the the reasons for going there. Yeah. So it's an it's definitely an interesting time. Um, you know, um, we've seen some of our um, supply chain moving from from China to the US mm. and you definitely pay more, but um, 
things can happen a bit quicker mm. and and communication is easier, uh, that sort of thing. So with regards to, you know, the original question about how is Australia, um, Australian manufacturing going to develop, I think it will take some time. I hope that it will, um, that will start to pick up. Um, but yeah, the environment needs to be right. The economic environment needs to be mm. there. Um, and, um, you know, maybe I think there's, um, there's, uh, it could be a bit maybe consumer driven as well. Mm. You know, as I think definitely COVID, like I said before COVID uh, and those supply chain issues have really made a lot of people look inwards a bit more and go, hey, yeah. gee, that was a massive problem. We, re we really need to um, be concentrating on, on making a lot of stuff at home. Um, I think um, I think it was Electrolux had, a, had an issue where they couldn't get supply of some components from overseas um, and they had to shut their factory for a couple of Good. months or was it a couple of weeks? But anyway, Good. shutting your factory for any period of time is, is not desirable. Um, and they pivoted and, and started um, making those components in-house. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing is pretty impressive. And, yeah. um, and if more businesses are, are doing that, then mm. um, I think, you know, it'll, it'll spread. Unfortunately, the car industry dying in Australia really um, hurt a lot of those support businesses like, yeah. you know, injection molders and, and um, uh, all of the businesses that relied on the car industry. And, and so, of course, for the rest of us who also use those businesses, uh, they weren't there anymore. Yeah. So then, okay, we have to go offshore. I think as well, like a lot of, a lot of car companies, um, you know, globally, the only reason why they continue is from government support. Like specifically yes. in, I think it's in Italy, some of the car companies, they wouldn't be where they are today if they didn't have continuous government support. Um, yep. You know, like whether that's like, you know, reduce tax rebates, whatever, just to keep them afloat because it's important to have onshore manufacturing, <laughs> like from even yes. a defense perspective or, you know, anything, you don't know what's going to happen in the world. You need to have your own capacity. Yeah. Well, yeah. When I was over in Germany, uh, visiting our, our um, manufacturer over there, you know, we, we drove to, to see a, um, a die caster mm. and we hopped in um, one of the guys company cars and we were, I was sort of like, oh yeah, nice Q5. That's that's nice. And he was like, oh, do you guys have company cars? And I said no, because uh, it's a fringe benefit in Australia. You get taxed for for um, that sort of thing. So a lot of companies don't do that anymore. Really? Uh, and he said, oh, that's interesting. He said in Germany, you're incentivized to uh, to purchase company cars that are made in Germany. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a completely exactly. different way of, of thinking about it. Um, and I was like, well, that's probably why our car industry, well, one of the reasons why our car industry died because yeah. it, the thinking was not right. You know, yeah. I know it's more complex than that, but, yeah. um, yeah, it was, a, I thought that was an interesting, um, an interesting point, you know, mm. the, the differences between the way the, the, the company, the, the countries run. Yeah. Well, um, are you familiar with Neil Davison from, um, yes. Vesta? Yeah, he, he's yeah. working on an initiative where he's basically, um, I think he's working with the government to better understand the systems going, you know, throughout Australia and understand the limitations where we just don't have any manufacturing capabilities or in, in all sorts of other um, areas as well. From a design perspective, basically understanding, you know, the logistics of Australia and realizing the areas that need some, you know, some capacity because there's just so many yeah. areas right now where we have, as you're saying, like you want a die caster. It's not, it's not really possible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. I'm, you know, I'm glad that that Neil's doing that sort of work, and um, you know, he's pretty well positioned to be doing that. So, um, it's important, you know, um, it's important that designers are out there having these conversations as well, because, um, yeah, you know, a lot of these manufacturing businesses um, are kind of on their own. You know, <laughs> they need all the all of the other professionals around them to, to, um, to jump in and try and help out. Yeah, exactly. Um, what are the positive negatives of the approach um, to manufacturing in Australia versus manufacturing overseas? Um, and do you believe that, um, do, you, do you believe that 
there are significant benefits to manufacturing in China for Australia, or do you think it's there's only really going to be detrimental effects if we long term manufacture overseas? Uh, look, as there's good and bad in everything, you know. Um, I, you know, China can be great if you've got the right fit for that company. Yeah, um, and that that I think that's it. The fit has to be right. Is really what it what it comes down to. Um, you know, speaking from you know Top Gun's point of view, uh, for example, our the stuff that we sell is kind of low volume, high value. Mm. You know, it's thousands a year, not hundreds of thousands a year. Yeah. That, that sort of that sort of thing. So um, often, um, you know, manufacturing offshore, particularly, um, you know, I don't want to be China bashing, but you know, <laughs> you were talking about China, but. Um, you know, you don't get a lot of attention if mm. you don't have a very high uh, volume. Yeah. And so then, okay, you, you've really got to go there. And that's expensive, mm. you know. Um, and, easy. of course, throughout COVID times, we mm. couldn't go there. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was really difficult. So mm. we had – we, we oh, spent a lot of money uh, on um, Teams calls. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of time. A lot of people on calls um, talking to manufacturers, um, trying to work through issues that would have been a lot better um, or a lot easier to solve if we were there, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think that's one of the advantages of Australia, for instance, is that it's not very, it doesn't, it's not very expensive or it doesn't take very long to go to that manufacturer, even if they're in Perth or Adelaide, let's say. Mm. And, you're and there's really- no language barrier as well. There's no language barrier barrier or anything like that. Um, so you know that's that's definitely a big advantage um, is being able to actually go to the place. Mm. So uh, yeah, and like we we're saying before, you know, the actual landed cost of goods gets affected by that. Yeah, um, I think some of the some of the, the the depth of manufacturing in China is really good. Like there's yeah. so many, there's so many choices and maybe that's also a good thing and a bad thing because, mm. you know, it's, it's hard to, to navigate if you're not, if you're new to it, mm. um, it can be difficult to navigate and you can fall into some traps, you know, um, uh, had experience with a previous company that I was at where, uh, you know, there was a, uh, some some manufacturing development work done and certain deals that were that were done based around that and it meant that the um, the manufacturer in China wasn't really motivated to continue developing uh, the the tool because to them it was fine yeah and but for us as the company we were not fine with that and so that became a very um, difficult situation to work through you Mm -hmm. know so um and i think there was a bit of yeah um if we'd been a bit more experienced in dealing with with manufacturers um over there maybe that Mm -hmm. wouldn't have happened but um but um yeah look definitely pros and cons of each other i've had some really great experiences with um companies in australia and Mm -hmm. and in brisbane you know even um where the quality is outstanding you mm. know but you pay for it um yeah. and i think you know it's such a complex issue because a lot of times in the consulting world you know you you might have a, a company or an established business coming to you but then other times you you've got someone who is uh you know it's just starting out in their manufacturing journey you know they yeah. they've got a product that they want to um put in into production and and so budget for them is really really tight yeah um and and manufacturing locally isn't as um as uh, attractive because of the cost Mm. so you know as a designer and as someone who's experienced in in fast all the facets of of making products all around the world you, you try to advise them but at the end of the day uh that dollar figure rule supreme in a lot of cases um so you know the level of experience i guess in manufacturing of the client mm. comes into it a lot in terms of where you're going to manufacture something yeah. um and uh you know definitely seen projects 
you know, customers, uh, clients decide to do things one way where it's not exactly what what we have been uh, recommending, let's say. Mm. And yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, they're paying the money. So um, to move on from that, you mentioned you've, you've had a lot of experience in, you know, in-house teams and also consultancies. Um, would you be able to talk to, you know, the differences uh, from your experiences and maybe, you know, the positives and negatives and, you know, yeah, just how you, how you saw your experiences? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Look, um, I think uh, in-house, the big thing about working in-house is that you get the, the full picture yeah. of, of everything, you know, um, you get to see um, everybody from the office admin person to, to the, you know, in, in some cases, if you, if there's a manufacturing facility, you know, you, the, the factory floor, you know, um, you, you get to understand that business end to end and you also get to understand the industry mm. that that you're working in um and, and it's you get a much deeper engagement i mean i think that um consulting sometimes you're selling your, your time and i think this is the big difference in consulting you're selling time mm. and in a in an in-house role the company is selling a product mm. and um there's a big difference there and um often clients in a consulting um uh, environment they don't see the value in some of the research that that needs to be done mm. um some clients come to you you know it's the classic thing um they come to you with their solution to a problem mm. rather than the problem yeah. and uh and the and so part of the design process is kind of um lost in, yeah. in the beginning and then uh, what also tends to happen is, you know, that manufacturing development at the end of a project mm. uh, can often be lost as well because a client might say, well, this is, you know, I'm just going to take what you've done. Thanks very much. It's great work. Awesome. And they they go on their merry way and you sort of are disconnected from the, mm. from the end result. So that can be frustrating sometimes, um, you know, always in a consulting environment, it's, you know, the, the relationship between a designer and the client is so important um, and there has to be that trust that's there. Mm. Um, and it's true. Some clients are better than others. You know, some clients get it. They come in and they let the designer do the design work and, mm. and, and be the designer. Um, and they, they let the design team run through the full process, mm. um, but others do not. Mm. And uh, yeah. that's just the reality of it. The great thing about consulting is that you get to do lots of different projects. Mm. Um, you know, when I was uh, consulting, it was fun. It was really fun. And um, it was breakneck speed. I remember after working in-house for a while, I came into a consulting environment and I was like, oh man, this is, this is fast, you know. <laughs> it was a bit of a learning curve. Um, but, you know, uh, it took me a few weeks to, to really get up to speed, but once I did, it was awesome, you know, yeah. um, but, you know, working in-house now, I think I've probably done enough of both to kind of know where I feel most comfortable. Mm. Um, and, that, and, and I do feel most comfortable in an in-house role. Mm. Um, and I think this, where I'm at now is, is good because um, I've kind of, there's a lot ahead of me in terms of really bringing top con, um, forward to being a design-led organization mm. um, from being more of an engineering-led organization. Mm. And so we've got a lot of great engineers that work here. Um, and a lot of them are really excited about uh, design and, and what that can bring. And I've had conversations with a lot of them that are, that are so happy now that we have designers here because they're like, oh, thank God. You know, um, it seems like with engineers, it can be very different. Some of them can be like very apprehensive towards designers, and other ones can be like, you know, very accepting. It's it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. 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 It is interesting, and um, you know, I've experienced both over over time. Some some engineers embrace it and and get it. Um, others maybe feel a bit threatened, but um, but I think it's it's only because they're not maybe don't quite understand the design process. They have a kind yeah. maybe a notion of what design is that's not 
exactly correct. Um, and I think that's part of, you know, part of my role is, is actually explaining to people what design is. It's not about making something look pretty. Yeah. Um, you know, it's about creating um, great experiences for our customers and uh, creating products that are connected and uh, uh, are a pleasure to use and that uh, creating that, that experience for our customers where they don't want to use anything else but Topcom, you know, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. And um, yeah, I think getting that message across, it takes some time, you know, mm -hmm. um, some people are more receptive to it than others, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. And what are, what are the unique challenges and benefits of each? Um, and also maybe talk, could you, could you speak to, how you as a manager, how you lead your team from more of a design perspective opposed to, you know, just a classic management perspective? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I guess, how do I lead the team? Um, hopefully, they would say by example. <laughs> um, but what I try to do is, um, I guess, clear the way for the team to mm. do their work, you know, um, there, there can in the day to day. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of fires that have to be put out uh, daily, and that can kind of sometimes be be crippling. Yeah. Um, when you, especially when you got to sit down and and do design work, you need to really um, focus on that and and immerse yourself in it. And and if there's all these things happening left, right, and center that distract you from that, it can really derail the whole process. So. Mm -hmm my my role or the way i try to 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 run things is to i guess manage up and try and clear the way set the processes um set the expectations um from others in the organization uh so that the way is clear for the designers to come and do their job mm. you know um as well as that i try to be um I try to push the envelope a little bit, you know. Um, I try not to be too too much of a micromanager, you know, because that, that's annoying for everyone. Yeah. Um, but it's a balance, you know. Like, um, on the one hand, I want the team to be uh, free to be uh, doing their best work and feel mm. comfortable and, and nurtured. Um but on the other hand, ultimately the output is my responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I will be, I will also kind of sometimes play devil's advocate um, and uh, offer a different point of view, mm -hmm. um, participate in some, um, you know, review sessions and ask some difficult questions sometimes just to to try and, um, and, and it's not it's not about anything other than trying to you know, get to the best possible product mm. at the end of the day, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the, the uh, approach I take um, as well as just being, like I said before, you know, advocating for design, being the evangelist in the company that is um, the, the design figurehead, I suppose, for want of a better description, you know? Mm, yeah. um, and in that way, if design is more uh, of a day-to-day -day term <laughs> that's spoken about in the, in the company, mm. then that makes it easier for the guys to, to, to do their work and, mm. um, and, you know, do great work. I'm very lucky. I've got a very good team of, mm. of industrial designers as well as UI UX designers. Mm. Um, so, you know, they do great work um, uh, and so, yeah, my job is just to, facilitate and push out all the barriers out of the way so that they can continue to do good work yeah. um i myself am a recent graduate and i know a lot of my friends are in that position where they're kind of moving into the first role or maybe like looking for the first role out of university um you know do you have experience hiring graduates and like what you know like what challenges have you faced what um you know positives have you noticed and like maybe how could a graduate make themselves more desirable to be employed by a company like topcon yeah, look, uh, I've yeah definitely hired graduates before. Mm. Um, one of those graduates works works in the team now, um, and uh, I think 
you know what the best the best thing that a graduate can do is just be tenacious mm. and be keen mm. you know um i think resumes also if you, you know from if you're sending a resume in you're applying for a job or something like that that resume needs to be a really good representation of you as a designer mm. i've seen a lot of resumes come through in word that you know just just word documents with no real formatting and no no, no kind of uh, indication that this person is a designer mm. um and i think for me you know it's important to put your best foot forward when you're applying for a position mm. um even if you don't have like a huge folio you know coming out of uni um you might have you know one or two things from uni that you can show and maybe some personal projects and that that sort of thing that's really all you need you know yeah. as a graduate I don't, i'm not looking for a massive body of work but what i'm looking for is someone who's really keen and interested yeah. um and and willing to listen and you know if you maybe aren't successful then you're contacting me every couple of months just to touch touch base and keep that name keep your name front of mind you know People that do that tend tend to be the ones that that you remember, mm. um, and that um, will kind of snare a position. Yeah. You know? So be tenacious, be keen, show that you love design, and show that you're willing to learn. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's really the the only advice I can give. I think. Um, and and look from the experience I've had, there are lots of different graduates coming out these days you know who want to do different things it's not everybody wants to be a nuts and bolts designer right a lot of people want to uh kind of move more in more along into the business strategy um field and mm. and do those sorts of things which is fine but if you um from my point of view you know the work that we're doing is you know we're, we're designing products and working out how to put them together mm. and how to make them you know work and Mm. uh be manufacturable so if that's the sort of stuff that you're interested in then yeah mm. show me i guess <laughs> i suppose if you have that foundation in the more practical side of design if you ever do move on to those roles you're going to be a much better manager than if you just have no basis in that mm. yeah that well that would be yeah i would agree with that 100 percent. you know um and you know i think also for graduates it's probably not a bad idea to go and work in-house for a year as mm. well. You know, if you can, you know, got, coming straight from uni into a consultancy, sure, you can do it. Um, and, you know, there's plenty of great designers um, who have done that. Um, mm. But I think, I just think back to my experience leaving uni and being able to walk out into a factory every day and mm. actually see things being put together there's really a lot of benefit in that. And you learn a lot. Mm. You learn a lot of practical skills. Like there's still, I guess, skills from those days that I use now, you mm. know? Um, and part of that is being agile. Mm. You know, designers in Australia tend to be very agile because mm. we have to be very flexible because we wear a lot of different hats, you know? Um, so, you know that that experience of having to really think on your feet and and solve problems quickly um uh, come up with alternatives you kind of pick up the notion of doing that and and use it throughout your career so mm. i think it's really beneficial mm. yeah definitely um how do you mentor and guide to help to help um you know graduates and other designers under you succeed in their careers and what advice would you give to someone you know who's maybe at that point in their career where they're looking to move on to the next step, um, but they're not sure what that is. Yeah, look, that's moving, moving to the next step. So there's a, mm. uh, a difficult one. You kind of need to know, you know, how to get there. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's hard. I mean, I think um, experience and time obviously helps experience um, being, being strategic about what experience you do get and where you work. Yeah. also helps you know um so uh to be honest with you i don't think i've been that strategic in my career you know i've kind of gone from one one job to the to the next and um uh, happened to learn a lot along the way mm. but um, there's probably others that have done it uh, better than i have and been more strategic about it but 
in terms of mentoring, um, I, I really like to, um, I guess, answer lots of questions. I like to have a, I like to have an environment where someone feels like they can just ask questions and that there is no stupid question. Right. Mm. Um, everything's, everything's on the table. Mm. Um, you know, I think, um, guiding someone by not necessarily telling them what to do, but, um, helping them to find their own way, mm. um, is, is, is the way to do it. Um, because everyone has their own pathway, right? There's many ways to get to where you need to go. Mm. So um, listening is also a really good tool, you know. Just mm. to just listening to to people's concerns and un- and understanding, like especially you know junior designers, they they tend to maybe worry about things that they don't really need to worry about, and and so listening and reassuring can actually be a really uh, um, helpful thing. And 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 I think. Um, I've found that reassuring people that they don't need to know everything is, mm. is also really helpful, you know, yeah. as a, as a graduate or as a junior, um, you know, all I can ask of you is that you, uh, that you're a sponge, mm. you know, um, and that it would, it's the great thing about um, younger designers is that they bring, they always bring something to the table that's new. Yeah. Okay. They always bring a new technique or a, a new little piece of technology or a new way of doing things that um, that can help the whole team. Mm. So, you know, allowing that to, to, to kind of come in and not being too rigid about the way we do things, being flexible. I think, yeah. is I, think I think that's a really interesting approach. Like I think a lot of um, managers and, you know, even, even I've talked to so far in my process of even just looking for a job, a lot of them have expected, you know, everything like this designer is going to know everything. And it's like, I think, you can feel very disconcerting when you're, when you're looking for a job, when, you know, there's all these pressures of like, you should know all these different things. But like, I think your approach is really interesting because uh, I think a lot of people, I, even I've spoke to for my grade, they're in the same boat and they're worried about mm. finding that job because they don't feel like they've got every single skill that is needed. Um, but yeah, like yeah. there are, there are companies out there that have this approach and it's good to see. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if you're an industrial designer and you, you're expected to know everything, um, <laughs> the degree probably would never end. Yeah, you know, because <laughs> that's the thing. You got the, the nature of industrial things to teach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, you know, the nature of industrial design is that you're you could be one day designing a, a television, another day you're designing a car. You know, then you're designing a coffee machine or a or a tape measure. You know, like you can't know everything, mm. and um, you know, you can know how to design. You can be um, you can know how to, to uh, apply the design process and and um you know be be skilled at design thinking you can know how to draw you can know how to you know use cad um they're sort of you know they're the start off basic tools but everything else has to be learned you know Mm -hmm. um it's interesting i remember back uh back in uni having a discussion with my lecturers about why is industrial design a university course Mm -hmm. you know it doesn't necessarily fit into that whole structured university way of assessment and mm. you know should it be should it be more of an apprenticeship style of thing yeah. um you know maybe it should it's an interesting um discussion and there's a lot of pros and cons for, for both but mm. but i i do think that it would be it would be great if if it was more of that style yeah. of thing and you you kind of were mentored along the way mm. you know mm. um I think it would it would be interesting to see what graduates would be like and whether I think they would be more confident mm. um, because it's scary. You know, you're leaving uni, you're in this protected environment and then you're going out into the big bad world and <laughs> someone's there, you know, you. I, I still remember what my first day, um, you know, you got six weeks of uni to do this project and they're like, okay, we need that in six days. Mm. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, it's a bit of a shock to the system, and you yeah. and you you've got to adapt pretty quickly. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting way to look at it. Like, you know, a lot of people have spoken on the podcast about that how they they feel like we've lost that maker aspect of industrial design um, that was definitely around in the in the previous yeah. you know, university degrees. But you know, having more of like a trades approach to it, where you you know, and even even from getting a job, 
from a perspective of getting a job, if it was a trade craft, you know, you're working for like eleven dollars an hour to start. There might be a lot yeah. more companies willing to take on designers if they get, yes. you know, if there's a if there's a reason. And then, and then also, I feel like even from my perspective, like I look at some of my friends who have done trades, and it's like they've been working for the last five years while I've been like at uni paying money. You know, yes, I mean? <laughs> it almost doesn't make sense. You know, like you have yeah. to be very passionate about a career like from my perspective you have to be passionate about a career and what you're doing at university to be willing to pay that much money to not work to not work as much yes you do you have to take a leap of faith i mean um and you know i guess uh yeah starting any degree you don't really know what it's going to be like Hmm. until you start it yeah and then you might like the degree but then you start working and you go this is not really for me Hmm. you know um so yeah a more kind of apprenticeship based model Mm. might be nice you know um i mean i really liked uh the the auxiliary design model you know talking about neil um and that was that was really cool Mm. um and if that was the approach um yeah we'd we'd have some some pretty awesome designers i think Mm. are you familiar with offsite the um, course in America, Offsite? No. Offsite's like basically, um, it, I'm pretty sure it kind of stems on from auxiliary in some degree where it's like an online industrial design course. Um, okay. Different sta- well, th- three different stages, I think. There's um, like, you've never learned about anything about design. They teach you the basics. And then there's the middle one, which is like, you're already an industrial designer and you'd like to be better at industrial designer. And okay. the thing is, it's actually taught by industry experts, like famous designers from all over the world who have, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of experience, they teach the specific classes. Um, okay. Like, you know, best sounds cool. kind of deal. And like, I feel like maybe that in co- in um, connection with like a trade could be interesting. You know, you get yeah. the whole conceptual side of design that you'd get at university from something like that, but then you get the hands-on, you know, maker approach from the trade. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that um, that's a great approach. You know, mm. you still need that. Yeah. You need that classroom um sort of type of learning i suppose um but yeah the the on the job practicality nuts and bolts this yeah. is you know these are the challenges those sorts of things um that you know i think it would have been really nice to have more of that, that experience and and you know yes you can go and do work experience um uh, and but sometimes that's hard to 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 snare a good place to do that you know especially when you're studying, like you say, you know, you've, you've got your study, but then you've also got to work a part-time job to, mm. to afford to live. And then you, if you're an intern somewhere and they're not paying you, well, yeah, that's more time that that takes up. And so it becomes really difficult, yeah. you know? Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I get it. It's, it's a, it's hard um, when you, you know, a struggling student trying to put yourself through mm. something and um, yeah, you might not like it at the end. <laughs> so yeah it would be it would be an interesting model to see um how the how that would go yeah Yeah. um to move on from that with covid we've experienced this move to remote work um there's definitely been a greater acceptance in the industry of you know the possibility of remote um and it obviously has its benefits do you think remote um, industrial design work could be something that becomes more prominent in the future where we could work more remotely with overseas and you know other states of australia yeah look um in a way we do it here, you know, we, um, our main head office manufacturing facility is in Livermore in California. Mm, cool. So we, we are, uh, the industrial design team is, is located in Brisbane. Um, uh, but we work with engineering teams all around the world mm. and, um, yeah, it certainly has its challenges. I'm not going to lie. Um, you can't always travel for every project. Otherwise we'd just be traveling the whole time. Right. Mm um uh and and look the whole working from home thing in the beginning i was really um not for it you know Mm. um but i've kind of come to see that uh it's got its advantages Mm. um and we kind of we we do a a three-day week model here where you know two days at home three days in the office Mm. um and we've we've found that that's a pretty good balance um Mm. because you know, I can talk with the team online about something, but 
I'm usually talking maybe with one or two people. Yeah. The rest of the team, you know, are somewhere else. They're not included in that discussion. There's so much that you learn sort of through osmosis, right? Um, from a lot of these discussions, if you're in the office and you and you're just around, mm. um, and and that's that's been one of the things that um, you know when we're when we're working in a consulting environment and everyone was in the one room, we had this big long table and everybody faced each other, and so you know you could everyone could talk to each other and everyone w- was hearing what was going on. Uh, and it was a great way to learn, mm. you know, you, you would learn stuff from a project that you weren't even working on, you know, <laughs> cause you would, you would overhear discussions and that sort of thing, uh, as well as the face-to-face collaboration and ideation, brainstorming sessions, all of those sorts of things. Um, it just works better face-to-face. Yeah. You know, I don't, uh, there's, I've heard a lot of people go on about how, you know, you can't make me come back into the office and, um, you know, I'm doing all my work yeah okay you might be doing all your assigned tasks but you know could you be doing them better with better collaboration in Mm. the office as a team you know um and look the flip side of that is there are tasks that you need to do where you need to focus Mm. so that is better maybe to to um to do on your own so you know um i think it's an interesting you know COVID has given us this or permission to have this hybrid working uh, style, um, and it seems to be it seems to be working for us here. Um, so I think it's yeah, it's it's a good thing. Mm. Yeah, I think you're completely right. I think some jobs you can definitely substitute with completely remote work, but I think mm. design specifically, even UX design, you could maybe get away with it to some degree because it's it's very computer based. But industrial yeah. design, you've got that physical component, you've got that interaction, you've got that even like the um, anthropometric testing, like your prototyping you know testing out with different people in the office like you can't do that you know from that remote setting that's right and and i mean you know even from the the ux design perspective you know um the ux uh the ux team um you know they're located in uh, uh, there's well we have one designer here in brisbane uh the rest of them are located in europe in, mm. in different locations in finland uh and in the netherlands mm. um and yet they managed to work pretty well remotely. Um, they've got the tools to do that. You know, if they're using Figma and that allows them to collaborate very mm. easily. Um, and But still, they get together for workshops with product managers and, and stakeholders um, at specific locations because sometimes you just need to be all in the same room, right, you know, and thrash something out. So I think it's just about... I think just the old rules of having to come to work every day just don't exist anymore. Yeah. And, and everybody's now thinking about, well, does it actually make sense? You know, mm. you know, I had to pay, it's going to cost me like 15 bucks to, to park and, <laughs> and lose two hours of my day mm. uh, coming into the office. I could be more productive at home on that day. And yeah, mm. you know, most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. yeah. No, it's definitely an interesting way. And I'm, I'm, it's inter- it's very interesting that you guys have taken that approach. I feel like a lot of companies haven't necessarily adopted it, but it's good that you guys are moving on with that. Hmm. Well, yeah, it, it kind of, um, uh, you know, it's a really competitive environment now with um, design and engineering, you know, trying to attract the right people hmm. uh, is difficult, you know. Um, it's really, it's, a, it's an employee's market, I suppose, you know. Hmm. And um, lots of people want to work from home because it suits their lifestyle Mm. um and i think you can't ignore that you know when you when you're hiring people um you have to be flexible uh Mm. to a degree and and but like i said you know it actually works quite well (laughs) so you know we'll we'll definitely you know have there's really a, it's really a revolving door here. You know, some people will come in in the morning and then work from home in the afternoon and, mm. you know, oh, I've got someone coming to the house. So I'll work from home today or, you know, it's, it, it's way more relaxed than the stringent rules of like, it's, it's 8am. Why aren't you here? Yeah. And, you know, um, uh, in the past it w- was quite, um, quite rigid and, and a little bit stressful sometimes. Mm. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you have a lot of experience as a design manager, um, and you've obviously met a lot of other design managers over your time. What are those specific, what are the specific qualities that you see that all design managers should be able to, should possess and should, you know, bring on to their team? 
Um, I think you have to be uh, relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have to. I think you've got got to not sweat it too much. I mean, um, I've worked for some people who are really highly strung. Yeah. And, and it and it creates a really stressful atmosphere. Um, I think with design, it's really important that everybody is motivated and comfortable uh, and, and, and relaxed, you know, that's how you get the best out of people when they feel comfortable, they feel secure in their position. um, And, and they feel like um, they can be themselves. Mm. So creating an atmosphere like that is really important. And that's what I try to do. Mm. Um, And sometimes that doesn't, um, 100% 100% gel with a particular company, maybe. Yeah. Um, at, at TopCon, it does. TopCon is very, very open um, and very uh, kind of accepting company. So different styles of work are, are fine as long as the work is, is done, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, try, I, I think being relaxed, um, being available mm-hmm. and – and uh and also caring you know um your team is not just your team to get work out of they're all people and they've all got their own stuff going on outside of work um and i think understanding what um what people are going through and accepting that and working with people Mm. is a really good way to get the most out of them and that builds loyalty you know if you've got a loyal team um that that functions well and and everyone's relaxed you're going to get the most out of them um Mm. of course they can't be too relaxed where they're just sitting around and doing nothing all day i mean that's the (laughs) they but they have to be motivated yeah um but that comes down to i think team culture Mm. uh and picking the right people yeah you know um uh, building a team is a really tricky thing to do because you're trying to find people to join the team and trying to establish whether they're the right fit in an interview. And yeah, yeah it's, it, you don't always get it right, you know, um, but understanding the key elements that make the team tick and make the team work and then looking for that in new people so that they, um, they come into the team and gel mm. that man, that is, that's hard, but when, when you get it right, it's it's golden. You know, mm. um, it, it it really nothing upsets a team more than someone who doesn't gel. Yeah, you know? no, yeah, definitely. No, I've I've noticed in my current position um, where I've just started, like even just be spending more time out there with the manufacturing people, building that relationship. You know, I have like a first name relationship with them now. You know, that, that mm-hmm. relationship means one day when I need to go and ask them a question, you know, they're going to be ready to receive. They're not going to feel like there's a barrier between design and manufacturing. And that's exactly. probably, that's, that's the reason why I was sent out there, I suppose. Yeah. I to build that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I used to make a point of, um, when I was working at the, at the sign company, I used to go and have smoker with the factory guys every day. Yeah. And, um, you know, because you don't want to create this us and them, mm. Exactly. sort of thing that, that goes on and a lot of people do like to do that and i think it's crazy you know yeah. <laughs> because um everybody's working together and you and and you know it was it was great i used to love smoko <laughs> yeah, i specifically eat lunch that's a great conversation on purpose for that reason i think yeah. like that's the that's the moment you're sitting down you're relaxing that's when you make the best relationships yeah yeah 100 yeah, percent. and you know we I definitely saw the benefits of doing that. I mean, I just, I did, to be honest with you, I wasn't very strategic about it. And I used to just do it because, you know, I liked the guys. Yeah. You well, know? That's also, yeah. all <laughs> and, just, and, and, and then done. after a while, I sort of, it dawned on me, oh, wow, this is actually really good from a work point of view as well, <laughs> because um, I can see other people who aren't doing this and there is a little bit of a barrier there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. um, it all just comes down to treating people with 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 respect and and treating every person in the organization that you're working for as a team member there's you know i don't really um you know the whole hierarchy thing and uh it doesn't really it doesn't really make for a a um a relaxed and and good well-functioning team if you you know if you've got this overlord or yeah, you know, this, this designer on a pedestal 
that um, that doesn't work. And then I think that's, you know, that's the lesson I learned uh, when I started my first job. It's like, okay, here's the design. You shall do this. And uh, those guys were like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, when I started talking to them about, okay, well, what would you suggest? How do you think we should approach this? That's some great ideas, things I didn't think of. And then that's when I learned how important collaboration is with everybody in the um in the organization mm, yeah definitely um sustainability and environmental considerations are becoming increasingly important to design and and increasingly implemented um how do you address sustainability in your design process and in the design process of topcom um and what what solutions can we make to improve that uh it's this one is um something i think it's becoming increasingly important it's been important for a <laughs> for a long for a long time and i think to be honest with you in a lot of manufacturing um it hasn't been addressed enough yep. um you know there's the spin the sustainable spin uh and then there's actually doing something meaningful about it um yeah look i think um business in general and and design designers in general um at the grassroots need to be thinking about sustainability more you know um we have a sustainability team at topcon that that is reasonably new and they're looking into you know ways that we can improve the way we're doing and and you know sustainability doesn't just necessarily mean uh environmental sustainability you know it's it's it's, it's kind of a massive um it's a massive thing, but, um, you know, by what we do here, we make the products that we produce here by what they are, improve efficiency and, and contribute to using less fossil fuels, yeah. uh, which, which is a good thing. But, um, I think, you know, we've got, we've still got a fair way to go in terms of, um, how our products are made and um, because we're still doing things, you know, we're still injection molding plastic and we're still yeah. die casting and we're still powder coating things. Um, we try to design so that all of that can be disassembled and, and um, you know, recycling is, um, is easier, but um, the nature of our business in that it's a very harsh environment means that some of our products are potted, you know, and some of our products are um, single use. And, and, you know, so there's, there are challenges there that we need to overcome and, and get better at in, mm -hmm. in terms of how we approach the, the, the manufacture of those. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, look, it's, it's really important. And um, it's one of the, it's, it's one of the things actually when we talk about goals for the coming years that's that's high on the agenda is to um, work towards you know more sustainable mm. uh, products but you know like it's um it's hard yeah it's hard. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard thing you can't you can't just say oh we're going to be you know we're going to be better at sustainability you know um the products that we design at top gone have to withstand such such amazing amounts of um, vibration and hot heat and and cold and everything in between, yeah. um, and so you know metal enclosures are kind of pretty common, right? So we're exploring different ways of doing that, um, but yeah, it's a bit of it's a long road. Mm. I think it is really difficult. I think sometimes um society kind of met, puts this you know everything needs to be sustainable but there's not really emphasis on how it's going to be done um and that it's also difficult as well and it's not just this simple one-step solution you know like it's it's a system-wide change it's it's changing the whole system to be to be accepting of you know new materials new processes and even changing the mindset of the consumer to not want always a repeat and a better product of this of the product they already have or you know or just yeah, there's just so many different aspects to it. And I think like a lot of times they simplify it just thinking it's a simple problem, but it's really not. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can, 
um, you could say, oh, well, you just use more recycled plastics, for instance, you know, <laughs> but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily work that way because, um, you know, when you're in a high performing product, you need the virgin um, material um, properties, which, you know, with regrind or recycled um, plastic, you don't always get, you know, um, but of course, um, I think there's more that can be done in um, using recycled and recyclable materials and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, biodegradable materials as well. Um, I think we can all be a bit smarter about that. Um, but my experience really has been that business in general likes to be able to say that everything's sustainable, yeah. but the but the put your money where your mouth is, isn't so much there. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that the top guns actually taking it seriously, mm. but um, yeah, I think that's been my experience in the past is like everyone wants everything to be, you know, all, every, every environmentally friendly, but uh, yeah. they don't pay for it. <laughs> that's the thing. You know, there's a bigger price tag. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I think we all have to, um, but I think that it is, changing and you know the days of someone just wanted to buy something because it's maybe it's cheap right it works and it's cheap and yeah. um, i reckon it's going to last me as long as i need it to last me those days are changing and, mm. and people are are becoming more and more um selective about what they purchase and what the environmental impact of that product is mm. um and which is a good thing because that means that you know, if it's consumer driven, there's no businesses have to take notice, you know, yeah. they have to take that seriously. Mm. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's encouraging. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, even I think as well, people think of sustainability, they think of recycling, you know, pretty much mainly recycling, but there's so many yeah. things you can do in the design process and in designing a product that actually makes it more sustainable. Like, for one designing something to actually be durable and actually last a long time like that is inherently sustainable you know what I mean? or yes. designing something that's just um you know repairable or you know modular like exactly. these are things that you can do that aren't even necessarily going to cost more money um that just make a product better yeah and that's and that's something that you know uh one of the mandates you know had uh here is that yes everything must be serviceable yeah. you know so you must be able to repair um every product Mm. you know um now sometimes that like i said sometimes it isn't it doesn't go that way and yeah. uh because of certain um constraints and and requirements but for the most part um everything you can open up and you know you can replace the board um and you can send that product uh, out there again um but the model or I suppose the business organization behind all that also has to be there to facilitate that, you know, there's no use having something that is repairable and then just replacing it, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then throwing it away because it's, oh, it's too expensive to repair because we don't have the infrastructure to uh, get it back to the customer. Yeah. We don't have the infrastructure to, you know, bring this in and analyze what's going, what's, what's wrong with it. Hmm. those sorts of things so it's not just a product level thing it's a business level thing hmm. and um and that's important to to understand is that you know uh you can design a product to be recyclable but if if the if the protocols aren't there hmm. it's not going to happen yeah the other day i had to go to the hospital i cut my thumb open with a grinder and uh i had to have stitches and this giant blue polypropylene bucket came out of a of a um uh, a, a sealed bag and it was it was all um wrapped up in in a in a in a sheet that was sterile and it had my thumb all washed out and everything and then the doctor went to take all of that and just throw it in the bin and we we're like oh what are you gonna do with that bucket <laughs> And she said, oh, I'm throwing it away. And I said, look, can we take it? Because we can use it. Um, you know, yeah, sure, you can't just wash it out and use it for someone else, but if we can at least take it and use yeah. it. And, you know, there is really no reason why that bucket can't be recycled. Yeah. You know, it, it, it could be, 
but the protocols in the hospital system aren't there mm. for that to happen. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the thing, you know, someone's gone to the trouble of making this thing um, out of a recyclable material in, you know, polypropylene. Perfect. But, um, but yeah, then it gets put into landfill, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it has to change. It's, it's not even just from a, it's, it's from a government perspective as well. Like we have even limited recycling, you know, infrastructure in Australia in general. Um, and yes. you know, that's something that needs to be developed over time. Yeah. Yeah. I actually did um, uh, one place I worked, we, we did a recycling bus. So I had to design a whole bunch of, it was a, it was an educational tool for kids. Mm -hmm. So they took an old uh, city council bus and fitted it out with all of these um, uh, recycling activities. And this bus would travel around to schools and, and the kids would learn about recycling. So we had to design all of these uh, conveyors and, and things that replicated the recycling process and mm. put it into this bus. And so it, part of the research for that was we went to a recycling station up the Sunshine Coast and talked to them about, you know, what they do. I feel and, like I remember. Yeah, it was. Bus. It sounds familiar. Maybe What's not. that? I feel like I remember seeing some sort of recycling bus when I was a kid. I don't know. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm just thinking now, like, I, I don't know. I feel like I remember. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it was a crazy project. It was one of those, it was one of those things where the bus is in the factory and we're working on it at 11 p.m. Yeah. and there's a launch event in, in, um, in uh, the city at City Hall at 10 a.m. the next day and we're still working on it. We basically finished it at like 8 a.m. and drove it in. Oh. <laughs> classic uh, classic down to the wire project. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, you know, we went to, to, to this recycling facility. It was really eye-opening to, to understand that even though something is recyclable, depending on where you live and, and what the, the protocols are in that area, mm. it won't be, you know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, that part, it, you know, relating that back to companies, um, the, the infrastructure and the, and the, the, um, the, the protocols need to be there. Mm. Yeah. Um, just to move on from that, you know, design is balancing creativity and that practicality um you know quite often especially within a manufacturing um standpoint you know how do you how do you navigate that that delicate balance and how do you ensure that design meets both an aesthetic and a functional requirement good question um functional functional is by far the number one thing mm. um usability uh uh, really actually is equal number one mm. um aesthetics i think um you know it kind of comes it kind of comes from the functionality you know i mean form follows function yeah. right uh <laughs> but um but i think um really keeping that focus on on the functionality on the practicality on the manufacturability mm. uh, of something it, it, it's important to do having an effective design brief actually mm. helps in a lot of ways mm. because um, you know you need that touchstone to keep coming back to does this satisfy the brief yeah um and i think um you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I was attracted to the design profession by aesthetics, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then it was only when I really started to get into design that I that I realized there was this whole other <laughs> functional aspect to it. And and then and an actual fact, the usability aspect of it um, was uh, was just as important. Mm. and and the aesthetics um I, the way i look at aesthetics is they are also functional right mm. like you don't um like take a consumer product um that that sells on the shelf right the aesthetics of that performs a function mm. uh and that function is to attract the the target customer to buy that thing mm. right and 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 to feel good while they're using it it might be aspirational it might be you know emotive um uh, you might feel a connection because because of the form um 
in the products that we design at Topcon, for instance, people don't buy them because they look good. They yeah. buy them because they make their life easier. Mm. They f- it, it's the functionality. Mm. They also buy them because they they have confidence that they will last and be rugged. So the aesthetic treatment of those products comes from a different angle. You you are uh, com- trying to communicate through the aesthetics that this product is rugged mm. and that you can trust it. Yeah, it's, it's a different way of it's a different way of communicating. So like conveying um, the aspect through aesthetics. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's what it is, and. Um, so it's in, it's important, and then the other side of the aesthetics there is that um, in a company like Topcon, where we get lots of products across, you know, uh, lots of different um, industries, um, there's that brand language where you want to make sure that every product that's released looks like a Topcon product. You don't have to have a Topcon badge on it to know that. Um, so that's got its own function, and and that you know, having that that consistent language helps to promote trust and loyalty, mm. you know, uh, in the brand. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's very important. And um, what we, what we try to do is set ourselves a bunch of parameters um, uh, that we can work within that we know that the functionality of a particular product is, is high priority. Right. Mm. Um, and and so we our visual brand language is designed in such a way that we we have a number of different design elements that we can apply to to different products mm-hmm. in a certain way that don't restrict that functionality. Yeah. Um, and that in some cases, you know, enhance that functionality, like heat fins, for instance. You know, we spent a lot of time designing heat fins. Mm. Now, um, if you've got uh, metal enclosures and lots of electronics inside, lots of processes, and they're out in the sun. It gets really hot, mm. uh, so you need to be able to dissipate that heat. And and so um, those those fins need to not only do that job; they need to look like they do that job, and they also need to be consistent across products. So we so it's a it's a real balancing act to uh, to kind of design a system. Mm. Um, that allows the flexibility it, uh, to to mold that system to fit each different functional group of functional requirements. Mm. Um, so it takes um, it takes a bit of experience and knowledge um, in the in the industry in the products mm. um, to be able to do that effectively. Um, you can't just walk in and and kind of do that. You need to understand the product. You need to understand the user, where that product, you need to understand the environment that product's got to work in, for instance, in this case. And uh, so, yeah, it's kind of a complex um, thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And of course, one of the advantages of working in-house is that over time, your knowledge base builds Mm -hmm. um, about that, about industry and things become, you know, a little bit second nature. Uh, you do things because you know that that's going to work or, you, or, you know, you've already asked that question. So, you know, the answer to it already and it's, you move on to different questions. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, look, um, it's a, uh, it's always a struggle, mm. you know, um, uh, but I think as long as the, the aesthetics or of a product communicates what it's intended to do, and it doesn't get in the way of the functionality or the or the usability. Mm. Um, that is, you know, that's when the balance is right. Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds that's really really good advice. Does um, it make sense? I don't know if that answer that actually makes, makes sense. sense. That's, I reckon it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, moving on from that, we've got to wrap this up because I'm sure you want to get get home and you know have some dinner. Yep, sure, sure. Um, looking into the future of of design as a whole. What most excites you in the industry, and you know what? What do you? What, what major changes do you see happening in the world of design? Whoa, it's a big question. Big question. Um, <laughs> look, I just I really believe in design, right? I I am passionate about how design can make things better for 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 everyone. Mm. You know, um, we're still, you know, 
the industrial revolution number one happened a long time you know in the early 1900s right mm -hmm. but we're still today doing things as as a society um and kind of ignoring people we're mm -hmm. ignoring users mm -hmm. and we're not at a point yet where there's this general understanding of usability mm -hmm. and and that if you design something for someone it mm -hmm. will be better yeah. um so i'm and i think you know design is gaining traction globally in australia um we've always been a little bit behind say you know europe in mm -hmm. terms of awareness of design and appreciation um for design we have this notion in australia generally that it's you know it's just making things look nice fluffy stuff <laughs> yeah lipstick on a pig that sort of stuff <laughs> but um uh, i think the the there are a lot more design consultancies around now mm. um, than, than there used to be i think design there's a there's a better awareness mm. uh, of what design actually is and so that's encouraging because i think it means we'll as a society start looking at the user you know user experience design customer experience uh design you know all of these um all of these terms and professions that didn't exist sort of 25 years ago mm -hmm. now exist and and that's a really good thing so i'm excited to see what that can what that can bring mm -hmm. and um i think uh businesses are starting to see the value of it i think a lot of businesses are kind of like well we need to get we need to get some customer experience experts in you know because we need to tick that box yeah well uh, I think that, um, you know, maybe now that's actually starting to see why. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm excited to see how that, I suppose, focus on the user is going to go. Mm. Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. Um, just to finish off, if you could give one piece of advice to yourself as, you know, someone my age just coming out of uni, getting their first job, what advice would that be? <laughs> um that would probably be get back in your box, get back in your box. <laughs> listen more listen to those people around you mm. um i think that would be it uh, i could have saved myself a lot of heartache and, and a lot of stress but um yeah listen listen to the people that know mm. and um yeah cool. that would be it. that's great well thank you so much for coming on today angus and no yeah, worries thanks for having me roman yeah, yeah. It was great. Thank you. Cheers, Have mate. a good one. Cheers. Bye-bye.